which would have us believe that a torrent of subatomic particles streams through our solid earth, shadows of antimatter dog our every step, and a curve ball of space would carry us into the past. Yet we continue to live our lives in a Newtonian universe, with ripe apples falling by gravity onto the cosy lawns of reality. Today the high ground of what we are assured is the truth is no less nonsensical than in Hume's philosophy, and, as ever, the laughably inadequate notions of common sense continue to suffice. Despite Hume's destruction of the basis for all science, he had the highest regard for Newton and his experimental approach. Indeed, Hume's notion of impressions may well have been inspired by a passage from Newton's optics about light rays and objects. In them there is nothing else than a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that colour. In other words, we don't experience the object itself. Hume had the deepest admiration for science, especially for the rigour of its methods. He felt sure this was the way to a better future. Yet, paradoxically, Hume's philosophy plunges humanity back into the past, to a position that it hadn't occupied since the Middle Ages. Copernicus had displaced humanity and the earth from the centre of the universe. Hume's solipsist empiricism firmly re-established humanity at the centre of whatever was going on, though in Hume's case this didn't actually include the earth, let alone the universe. Hume's position has many interesting anomalies. Berkeley had relied upon God to prop up the world when we weren't looking. With Hume, there was no world to prop up. And if there are no such things as corporeal bodies, continuity, or cause and effect, there is scarcely room for a God. Hume may not have believed in God, but his philosophy reduces us to a situation remarkably close to that of certain Buddhist mystics, who also don't believe in God. Where Berkeley had reduced philosophy to a joke, Hume explained the joke away. But this was unlikely to induce people to take it any more seriously. In 1739, Hume returned to Britain and published his treatise. He then sat back, waiting for the savage and vitriolic attacks that would inevitably appear from the critics, to which he would reply with consummate brilliance, thus guaranteeing him fame, money, public notoriety, the widespread approbation of poets and financiers, the love of fair women and financiers' wives, and all the other little marks of recognition that any tyro philosopher comes to expect as his due. Alas, this was not to be. Hume's great masterpiece fell dead-born from the press, as he put it. His work suffered the worst fate of all. No one noticed. And Hume's reaction? Being naturally of a cheerful and sanguine temper, I very soon recovered from the blow. He returned to Edinburgh and began writing essays on moral and political topics. These achieved some recognition, and in 1744 he put himself forward as candidate for the chair of moral philosophy at Edinburgh University. Unfortunately, it appeared that at least one person had, after all, read his treatise of human nature. A vehement objection was lodged against Hume's candidature, citing his treatise and claiming that it was a work of heresy and atheism. These were difficult charges to deny, especially to someone who had evidently read the book. Hume's earlier intention to dazzle the outraged critics with his brilliant reposts had presumably been based on the assumption that these critics wouldn't take the unprecedented step of actually reading his work. Hume wasn't given the job at his old university, and he left Edinburgh in disgust. Hume now decided to look for a job more suited to his abilities. Eventually he was offered the post of tutor to the mad Marquis of Annandale at his home near St. Albans in south-east England. This appeared to fit the bill, and Hume accepted. During the periods when his lordship was beyond even philosophic instruction, which appears to have been considered as a last resort, Hume started to write a history of England. But he soon became so dispirited that he gave up, promising himself that he would return to this project later. The country, too, was now in the grip of its own insanity, namely the 1745 Jacobite rebellion against English rule in Scotland. A Scottish army of five thousand men successfully invaded England, then retreated in embarrassment, and were finally massacred at the Battle of Culloden. Fortunately for Hume, he was in England throughout the rebellion, and was thus able to observe it with some detachment. A number of his friends in Edinburgh were forced to take sides with unfortunate consequences. Hume's dry comment on the affair was, Eight millions of people might have been subdued and reduced to slavery by five thousand 
the bravest, but still the most worthless amongst them. This episode had a profound effect on Hume. He had seen history unfolding around him even if he hadn't been directly involved in it. This deficiency was soon remedied when he was sacked from the job of tutoring a lunatic and forced to lower his sights still further by becoming secretary to a general. General James St. Clair was waiting to set off on a military expedition against the French in Canada when he took on his new secretary. The ships and the army for this expedition had all been assembled at Portsmouth for several months, but the Secretary of State, the Duke of Newcastle, couldn't make up his mind about precisely what to do with them. This was the man of whom it was said that he lost half an hour every morning and spent the rest of the day looking for it. Against some very stiff competition indeed, this period is frequently judged as the most incompetent in British military history, ideal subject matter for our budding philosophical historian who is now on hand to witness for himself the awesome wonder of the military mind at work. The Duke of Newcastle finally found his lost half-hour and ordered General St. Clair's expedition to put to sea and attack the French, not in Canada, but in France. When General St. Clair asked the Duke what they were expected to do with the specially selected and trained Indian trackers they had on board, this question was dismissed as irrelevant. The General then asked where in France he was expected to launch his attack, and was told that anywhere would do. General St. Clair, together with his new secretary, caught the stagecoach back to Portsmouth and went on board the expedition's flagship. Here he discovered a problem. No one on any of the ships had a map of France. Hume advanced the information that he knew what it looked like, and could even draw a sketch if the general wished, but in the end an officer was sent ashore to see if anything could be found in the local bookshop. He came back with a second-hand book about France, which happened to have a small map in the back. Hume confirmed that it was definitely the right shape, and the general set sail for France, having been informed that he couldn't miss it as long as he sailed due south. The British fleet finally arrived off Lorient whose position on the southwest coast of Brittany, that is, not facing Britain, suggests that General St. Clair may initially have succeeded in missing France. Just along the coast from Lorient, the general landed his army, while Hume avidly took notes for his projected history of England. The general's aim was to besiege the important naval harbour at Lorient, but unfortunately soon after he landed it began to rain. His three thousand troops had been cooped up on board their ships for months, and began suffering from cramps as they marched through the mud. In the end they couldn't even stand upright. Common sense suggests that something a little stronger than rainwater may have contributed to this condition. Meanwhile, inside Lorient, the French discovered they outnumbered the British invasion force by seven to one. The two opposing forces exchanged a few rounds of cannon fire, and the military geniuses on either side then retired to ponder the situation over dinner. The British High Command soon came to the conclusion that their legless troops were better off on board ship, and marched them back under cover of darkness. Meanwhile, the French commander, for reasons that only an expert military mind could possibly fathom, had decided to surrender. When the large French force arrived to surrender next morning, they discovered a few disconsolate British artillerymen whom everyone seemed to have forgotten about, sheltering from the rain beside their dripping guns. The French now found themselves with a superiority of nearly five thousand to one. Wisely realising that the sheer logistics of having to accept the surrender of so many men was obviously beyond these few ridiculous Britishers, the French changed their tactics and took the Britishers prisoner. Meanwhile, the British fleet and its philosopher-in-residence got lost in a storm, and after various adventures they all sailed home to collect their medals. As a result of this glorious campaign, General St. Clair was rewarded with the leadership of an important diplomatic mission to Vienna and Turin. He set off, accompanied by his secretary and staff of diplomatic advisers. Hume reacted variously to his travels through Europe. Germany is full of industrious, honest people, and were it united it would be the greatest power that ever was in the world, he noted perceptively. The common people are here, almost everywhere, much better treated and more at their ease than in France, and not very much inferior to the English, notwithstanding all the airs the latter give themselves. But Hume wasn't quite so impressed by the Austrians in Styria. As much as the country is agreeable in its wildness, as much as are the inhabitants savage and deformed and monstrous in their appearance, very many of them have ugly, swelled throats, 
Idiots and deaf people swarm in every village, and the general aspect of the people is the most shocking I ever saw. One would think that as this was the great road through which all the barbarous nations made their eruptions into the Roman Empire, they always left here the refuse of their armies before they entered into the enemy's country. Hume's reaction was not just an attack of spleen occasioned by the tiresome and enervating rigours of stage and in Hume's philosophy, and, as ever, the laughably inadequate notions of common sense continue to suffice. Despite Hume's destruction of the basis for all science, he had the highest regard for Newton and his experimental approach. Indeed, Hume's notion of impressions may well have been inspired by a passage from Newton's optics about light rays and objects, odd to prop up the world when we weren't looking. With Hume, there was no world to prop up. And if there are no such things as corporeal bodies, continuity, or cause and effect, there is scarcely room for a god. Hume may not have believed in God, but his philosophy reduces us to a situation remarkably close to that of certain Buddhist mystics, who also don't believe in God. Where Berkeley had reduced philosophy to it, which would have us believe that a torrent of subatomic particles streams through our solid earth, shadows of antimatter dog our every step, and a curve ball of space would carry us into the past. Yet we continue to live our lives in a Newtonian universe, with ripe apples falling by gravity onto the cosy lawns of reality. Today the high ground of what we are assured is the truth is no less nonsense. In them there is nothing else than a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that colour. In other words, we don't experience the object itself. Hume had the deepest admiration for science, especially for the rigour of its methods. He felt sure this was the way to a better future. Yet, paradoxically, Hume's philosophy plunges humanity back into the past, to a position that it hadn't occupied since the Middle Ages. Copernicus had displaced humanity and the earth from the centre of the universe. Hume's solipsist empiricism firmly re-established humanity at the centre of whatever was going on, though in Hume's case this didn't actually include the earth, let alone the universe. Hume's position has many interesting anomalies. Berkeley had relied upon God,